and a very warm welcome. You're joining us once again here at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24. And tonight we will be talking about Sri Lanka's economic recovery and whether Sri Lanka is on the path to emerge from crisis. The policy measures taken and the central bank's independence will be discussed tonight. And to discuss all this, we've invited to our studios none other than the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the 17th governor of CBSL, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Virasinghe, for taking the time to making time to be here amidst your busy schedule. But to begin with, I think we have much to talk about. The Central Bank is on the news. Mm -hmm. Parliament discusses the Central Bank as well. But um, when you took over, you spoke very much about the independence of the Central mm -hmm. Bank. Do you have that independence? Yeah, of course, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, the new act, this was approved by the Parliament last year, strengthened the independence of Central Bank in its operations. But even before, we had sufficient independence in the even previous act. It was there are some weaknesses they also addressed in the new act. So now the institutional independence is now established. So that I, I can say this current independence and also accountability, not only independence, the accountability is also strengthened. So early act did not have that kind of accountability and also that, that much of independence in implementing our key objectives. First one is price stability, second one is financial stability. I think now we have sufficient independence that I can uh, firmly say we have sufficient independence. That's actually a good one. Uh, if you don't fall under the purview of any institution, mm -hmm. who are you accountable for? Uh, this is why we say in the act, we are accountable to the parliament, we are accountable to the public in this country as a public institution. There are strong provisions in the new act. This is one of the reasons we at least once in three months, Parliament can call us, ask for explanation of our policies. We have commitment to the Parliament, to the public about inflation targets. A commitment to the country, to the Parliament of financial stability. We have commitment on the public debt management. All these things we are accountable. If something goes wrong, if we are not able to deliver our objective according to our mandate, according to the legislation, then we should be accountable and. Parliament can in time call us and ask for explanation and we are ready to have this strong accountability to the public and also we have certain requirements under the law. We have to uh, mainly, if we deviate from the inflation target, we have to make announcement to the public, to the parliament. We have to explain why that is a deviation, how we can bring it back and all this accountability points are much stronger now. Uh, a recent statement made in Parliament by the opposition leader that the central bank is not under uh, the Committee on Public Finance and it is under the government. We would like to seek your clarification on this. I think uh, under the new act, there is a provision central bank should be accountable and should be reporting to the Parliament. Mm -hmm. This was not there earlier. So as a result, there is no specific committee which has been given the mandate uh, for the central bank to report, but but we thought the committee of public finance is is kind of a relevant uh, committee subcommittee in the parliament that activities of central bank can be monitored and can be reported. As a result, there was an understanding by the parliament central bank. Uh, there are two committees. One is a committee on public enterprises because mm -hmm. is a public enterprise, so uh, auditor general has authority to audit central bank. So under those provisions we had even earlier, as a public enterprise, we are reporting to the parliament through computer public enterprises. But as a policy uh, part, which is the monetary policy and system stability, although computer and public finance is only for public finance matters, but there was understanding in the parliament that for the policy matters, we should be reporting through computer and public. That's why you should see in recent interaction of the central bank, Company and public finance has summoned us. We have been able to go there and explain on the policy side, but on the accountability side, on the accounts and all these things, this is company and public enterprise. There are two channels that we are reporting to the parliament. In addition, there is a committee on banking sector, this on the banking matter. There are several committees that we can be summoned by any committee or as a public institution. We should go and report. 
talking about independence of the central bank, I think we cannot avoid uh, discussing the salary hike, which has mm. taken center stage uh, even in parliament. On several occasions, the International Monetary Fund mentioned, even at this last review, the importance of independence of central bank. And it was said that the monetary policy should continue prioritizing price stability supported by sustained commitment to refrain from monetary financing and safeguard central mm. bank independence. But with recent allegations mm. and with the, the controversy surrounding the central bank's decision, can you assure of the independent status of the central bank will be safeguarded and that decisions will be taken in the best interest of the country? I'm sure now people have already, people in the country have realized the in importance of independent central bank. When you look at the central bank role in the economic recovery and stabilizing the economy in the last couple of years, I think it's very clear. We had a very clear role. We have been able to deliver that role because we had we exercised the independence that we, we had. As a result, there, is a, there are clear benefits in terms of price stability inflation, in terms of building up resource, in terms of stabilizing exchange rate, in terms of maintaining financial stability, preventing any banking crisis, and also in terms of our contribution to debt sustainability asset, public debt aid management of the public debt of the government. So the, all those fronts in, in our responsibilities have been able to clearly deliver what we are supposed to do with this independent central bank. Going forward, I think the, as a result, I think now there is some, in my understanding, there is a broader public support for independence. And that's why even if you look at the, some statement made by, in the parliament, it's just clearly recognized central bank should be independent. Mm -hmm. That I appreciate and uh, value that. And hope people in, in this country also value that independence. But there was a controversy because of the salary hike. I think to me, those are two different things. Salary issue of the central bank staff is an internal matter. That is, as the head of the central bank, board of the central bank governing board, our moral responsibility, there are twofold. One is our moral responsibility for the country is there in terms of policies. As I said, maintaining inflation, once and several, those are the moral responsibility of the country to recover the economy, stabilize the economy. But as the head of the institution, as a board of the central bank, we have moral responsibility for our staff to look after our staff and, and uh, address their concerns, grievances, and support the staff. Those who have been working very hardly, and they have made a lot of contributions to contribute their contributions to recover the economy. So those are two different things. And why Central Bank has been given financial independence, also to preserve independence and prevent any undue influence in terms of influencing financially to the Central Bank. That's why Central Bank has been given by the law independence, financial independence, to determine their salaries and wages and benefits of the central bank staff. This is not something new. Last 70 years, and the even under the previous Central Bank Act, yes, since I joined the bank in the last three decades, once in every three years, Central Bank has been increasing salaries compared to the banking sector or market. That has been happening once in every three years in the last 30 years. This is not something new that I, as a governor I did. This has been happening all throughout the period and there's a, in fact, there's a reality, there's understanding. Central bank employees as a public institution, central bank has been paying much as less than any of the public institution in the last 30 years. It's not something not new. In fact, the justification why this time there has been an increase by about 50% is that obviously there was a difficult period during the last several years as the head of the institution, as the board who are looking after the staff, we have a responsibility to support our staff to the extent possible, maintain the same practices we have been having in the past. It's not nothing new. Uh, so this is where I think people who criticize this probably have not even ignored what happened in the past. But Governor, they are also questioning the the ethics, the ethical right of the top financial regulator of the country to enable a salary hike to the staff of the central bank when government has failed uh, to give salary hikes to public servants by at least 20,000, given the current no. situation of the country. In, in my view, when you come out of economic crisis, only way to recover from the crisis is to make income of people higher so that they will be able to face high inflation, the impact of any crisis. 
this is one of the reason why the social safety benefit the samudra was increased by all, almost uh, three times the expenditure was increased by the government and the public sector salaries also increased to a certain extent but this is one of the first step so any if you look at any public institution since 2022 after the crisis with the very high inflation i think a lot of private institutions a lot of system enterprises mm -hmm. To a certain extent, they have been able to, and that's a good thing that they have been increasing, at least adjusting gradually, the compensation service of the employers to, to the extent possible. But why the government has not been able to raise that much of compensate fully for inflation is mainly because government institution rely on the tax revenues. Government can raise more taxes. I'm sure that uh, I'm also of the view, even public service salaries should be increased more. Because they can't afford to increase right now because of the not sufficient tax revenues. When the tax revenues are increasing, government should also be at the first instance. If they have capacity, they should be also increasing the salaries to the world servant to a certain to more extent. But in our case, it's a collective agreement once in three years, then only we fix for three years. But government can increase gradually based on based on their revenue collection. Even public institutions like in UN institutions, I'm sure all the public institutions or private institutions to support their staff to a certain extent, to an extent possible, they have been supporting staff. If, if we take a position that because of the crisis we should not increase salaries of incomes any people, then we will, we will never come out of this crisis. So in my position is that central bank would not depend on the directly on a consolidated fund or the direct you know, tax phase fund. We are contributing to tax phase in terms of paying dividends to the government. So to the extent given by the law that we have given independence, and also given the circumstances, if we are able to support our staff to a certain extent, based on the early practices, without violating what has been doing, I think we should be able to do every other institution. Are you if that is possible, I think that should be done in my view. Are you of the view again that this uh, collective approach to increase salaries and empower the people with financing ability uh, will really spur economic growth and activity in the country? That's obviously that's the basic principle of economics. So if you want to increase the economy to grow, people should be able to spend sufficiently for them to live. So that, that will create making activities that will help in increase incomes of other people as well. So that's why basic principle of economic recovery is to people to be able to earn higher incomes, improve their living standards so that they can spend more. That will help the economic recovery of the country. If you take a position, no one should be able to increase salaries or incomes for these people, economy will stagnate. So that to extent possible, if economy is recovering, if certain sectors, for example, tourism sector, mm -hmm. The tourism sector recovering, I think that's the best thing for tourism sector is to compensate, employ more people, pay them more so that that sector can prosper. Prospering in tourism sector means there will be benefits for other sectors. It is si similar to any sector for bank sector. If bank sector is making profits, they should be able to compensate their employees so that they have a high living standard. So at least they can live, they can face a crisis and that will have benefits to other sectors below effects. So this is how economic recovery process is happening through increasing incomes of people, either social safety through poor and vulnerable or public setting wage increases to the extent possible through the revenues or out of the profits generated by state enterprises or private enterprises, if they make profits sufficiently, they should be able to share the benefits of those benefits to a certain extent with their employees staff so that that's how economy, uh, economy staff function. Is government in a position to bear this burden of increased salaries at this current juncture? Now, government has already, even with difficulty, uh, we should appreciate government has built at least announced 10,000 rupees given the 1.5 million people employed by government. It's not an easy thing for the government to do. If anyone is asking to pay more for the public servants, then someone should be also arguing they should be collecting more taxes also. Okay. It's not that printing money and paying high salaries is not going to work. That will make things worse. So pay more salaries, increase salaries for the public sector should come from the much broader base, higher revenues for the government so that then they, the benefit can be shared with the people because a structural issue of the government uh, in this country, state sector, is that it's a very large sector. When you have 1.5 million employed, 
even increasing 10,000 is a huge amount. I think you can see the increase of uh, salary bill, the 10,000 increase. But what I think going forward to give that relief, government with the revenue increasing the for, for the next year, I think I have seen the government has indicated next round of there can be a gradual increases every year with the increasing revenues. That okay. has to happen. However, um, last question on the salary issue. Uh, uh, the Committee on Public Finance has recommended that the salary hike be suspended uh, until next year and uh, that uh, privileges given to central bank employees under the EPF be reconsidered. What are your thoughts on that? And there are also allegations about central bank making losses of 114 billion in 2023. Given this, there are questions whether the central bank can uh, increase On salaries. the first reporting, I think they're all misreporting. Uh, uh, as far as I uh, so this this report we have not received formally yet but I don't think what was reported today in the media is not correct I don't think I need to respond to that I think there will be accurate, accurate reporting all I can say because we are accountable to the parliament whether you agree or not as a public institution we certainly have a commitment to adopt the recommendations given by this independent review committee so we will adopt that recommendation. It does not, um, to me, as far as I know, some of the reporting that suspend or EPF, sorry, those are not correct statements, those are not correct, but I don't have time to give you, I mean, you will see the report. Uh -huh. That's that part, I think. We certainly, we are committed as a public institution to accept recommendation by the parliament as a accountable public institution. We will implement once we get the report formally. That I can give that commitment. Whatever the recommendation, I don't think those are correct. So going, for, I mean, your question on the central bank has been making losses. Mm -hmm. So last year, 2022 and 2023 especially, the reason central bank made huge losses is because central bank agreed to restructure our holdings of public debt, a large amount, and as a result, we contributed to the sustainable by over 700 billion rupees. So 2023, the loss is coming mainly from central bank. One day loss that central bank reported in the balance sheet of close to 700 billion as a result of central bank restructured our treasury bill holdings, short term bills into 20 year, 30 year, your low yielding treasury bonds. As a result, we made a loss. Okay. The loss is not a result of our inefficiency or bad management. It's because we made the huge, biggest contribution to the domestic debt sector, even more than the EPF made. We made 0.9% of gross financing need by the central bank. As a result, central bank balance sheet made a loss. But that is not a reason for the central bank to not to give any salary hike or anything as an independent for central bank. So central bank uh, outcome of the balance sheet profit or loss, central bank is not an institution like any other institution. It's a unique institution which would not target profit making profit or preventing making losses. Our uh, resource is to deliver price stability, financial stability, public demand, and other functions. When we deliver those functions, central banks, any other central bank in the world can make losses or profits. This is the outcome of delivering policies. Central banks can make losses of profits. That's why last time the loss was mainly due to central bank contributed to the public debt to reduce public debt, make public sustainable by 700 billion uh, the debt reduction for the government. That's why that was that is not a not a not a result of bad performance. It's actually for good cause that we have made. But even in the past, there were years we have been made closest. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's not a function of central bank for fall. It's a fun, it's the outcome of the policies that we implement. For example, if we appreciate the currency by 10%, we are holding large amount of foreign resource. Appreciation of currency means the value of those dollars in rupee terms come down. So in the balance sheet, that can seen as loss. So appreciation of currency, if that is a bad thing for the country, that is the outcome of the right policies implemented. That's one of the reasons why they have, a, uh, you know, kind of a losses. Central banks in some years, this is also one of the reasons, but major reason last year was the public debt management. 
So the, this is a main point is that central bank profits or losses. And also we do not rely on, we don't take money from conservative funds. We are making contributions to the taxpayers' funds, conservative fund by whenever profits, we distribute that profits to the government. That's a benefit for the country. Uh, let's take. Uh, if you can take us through the debt restructuring mm -hmm. uh, numbers, Governor, you mentioned the contribution made by the central bank even more than the EPF. Uh, but again, if you can ta talk about the numbers, because there are many parties talking about Sri Lanka's outstanding debt and debt restructuring, what it means for Sri Lanka. Of course, debt restructuring became a common man's term. Mm -hmm. um, Given the crisis, everyone talks about mm -hmm. economics, finances. But if you can officially tell us, uh, what the yeah, numbers I think are. Uh, when you think about I have talked about this mm -hmm. lot. I think uh, if you think about in April 2022, uh, when we had to announce uh, the standstill or temporary suspension of making external service payment, we were in a situation where in the next coming four or five years, government had to repay external debt obligations to the tune of $6 billion in every 12 months for the next four or five years. So when government has had the debt obligation, $6 billion per year for the next four, five years, and central bank had reserves for the country's old reserves, savings of foreign exchange, usable resource came down to $25 million. Mm -hmm. So when you have $25 million in your hand, and you have you no know, obligation next six months, six billion, another school, another six billion, then there's no other choice. So the, because we are too late to restructure debt, that was a position there's no other choice. We had to start restructuring of external debt. That was the beginning of the debt system process. It's not only external debt, when you say we had large domestic debt stock as well. So at the first point is that, first objective is to get a relief from social balance of payment point, from the foreign exchange point of view, instead of paying $6 billion a year, which is not feasible, which was not feasible anyway because given the level of resource. And we had to renegotiate and restructure really externally. That was the beginning. When we start renegotiating externally, then they, asked, they also looked at the sustainability by the IMF. Then they look at, they saw you need to restructure not only external debt, restore the sustainability, you need to restructure to a certain extent, domestic debt as well. So that came in September 2022. As a result, we started the process. Now we have completed the debt restructuring of domestic debt completely. As I said, Central Bank made the biggest contribution. EPF made a small contribution. Now, bank sector is stable. We have been main, able to maintain financial stability while bringing down domestic debt for another government already. They are enjoying that low debt service payments from the government side, from the domestic debt. But external debt, we, have in the, we are in the process of, we have almost completed the negotiation of restructuring bilateral official debt. That is Japan, China, India, they are almost final. We will soon sign up uh, the MOUs, which, will, which is a final stage. Once we sign up and agree to terms and conditions, what we are expecting. And third part is a commercial uh, restructuring of what is called uh, international salary imports, a commercial debt with CDB and ISB holders. That is also we are in the final process of finalizing. Once you do that, the relief what we are expecting, instead of paying $6 billion per year, it will be almost half of that we are here to pay. That's why a lot of people are talking about we have not paid some of the external debt. Once you start paying, you know, we will come back to the same situation. Uh, that is the main reason why we need to restructure. We don't want to come back to the same situation. That's why we restructure. We have a lower debt service payments going forward. For example, I'll give one example. Debt, foreign currency debt service payments. Last year, if we did not restructure, we had 9% of GDP in terms of foreign currency service payments. The restructuring targeting to bring it down to below 4.5%. This half of what we, we are supposed to pay in next 10 years. Okay. That is the relief we are expecting. Even debt to GDP, we had 128% of GDP debt to GDP. So we want to bring it down to below 95% in next several years. So this is the reason why it's a medium to long term debt relief for the government, as a result, this will not come back as a debt crisis, and government can afford to meet all these debt service payments out of their income. That's why we they need to record what they call primary surpluses, and also that's why we need to uh, achieve higher economic growth. 
So the capacity to pay would be much higher. Even current assessment, even if we grow at 3%, we will be achieving those targets under restructure in terms. But if we are able to grow above 3%, I am confident that we will be able to grow well above 3% going forward, which means government is servicing capacity would be much easier than what we had in the last 10 years. That's our objective. So this is why I think a crucial next step mm -hmm. is to complete the tax return process. Then obviously government will have a long, medium, long term relief. Government will not go back to debt prices if we complete the debt return process according to target. Then next any government, it will be easier for the government to manage their own expenditure revenue and invest and invest in public infrastructure all this thing it will be there will be much more room even as i said increase salaries of the public service when you say That's complete important. debt restructuring uh, process how soon are we looking at this you spoke about the mous that are to be signed uh, with the creditor nations mm -hmm. and and uh, also about private debt mm -hmm. there are talks about a delay in uh, private debt yeah, there has been delay. usually in the process if you look at it in the country like Zambia, uh, the ghana all these countries there's a sequencing process. So first part is uh, usually domestic debt we have completed last year. Mm -hmm. Then second one, official creditors, we will be completing soon. The next last step is to complete commercial creditors because the, the, the procedure process is that once you agree to terms and conditions, others will have to hold in the same comparable terms and conditions. So once you agree with the official creditor nations, what they call official uh, credit committee, once you announce, then all will be public. These are the terms and conditions. Then the balance part, official creditors also will have to come up with a solution which is comparable with what we agree to with the official creditors. That's the process. That's why this whole thing can't be done simultaneously because there's a procedure process, a negotiation process. So we have to take one by one, first the which is debt, and then the official creditors. Then final lap is the external. I'm confident that we should be able to complete. We have been following and negotiating and having discussion, making progress. I think this is, in my view, is we are in the last lap of this completion. Any notice. time frame, Governor? Uh, I don't think I should <laughs> uh, give any time frame. It's, it's not appropriate, but I know I'm very confident uh, we will be completing it very soon, both, whole process. Uh, what does this mean for the economy in the long term? Uh, we've, we've seen the President talk about uh, 2045 and then Previously, we spoke about 2025, which is just uh, a year away. But with all this, Sri Lanka has had a lot of expectations to have been developed by 2025. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, uh, maybe a decade or two ago. But now we're looking at 2045. Um, is there light at the end of the tunnel for Sri Lanka if we mm -hmm. proceed on these policies? Yeah, I think the first objective at the immediate one was to recover stability. Mm -hmm. With the crisis, we saw inflation went to 70 percent, no reserves, uh, you know, government wouldn't be able to pay in this, uh, all these issues. So first objective, in with as sooner the sooner the better, and that's what we have achieved, stability, stable macroeconomic conditions, and we have addressed immediate short-term needs, but still it's, it's not the full and full recovery, I have to admit that. So first stability, then the growth in the next step. So what, what you just mentioned by 2025, I think, uh, in my view, even before pretty soon, we should be able to basically achieve the full stability after completing deficit structuring. Then next step is to we would expect the rating agencies to improve our ratings and then uh, have more sustainable debt for next 10 years, not for one year, two year. Next step is to stabilize the common deserves for the next 10 years. But by 2024, by end of this year, at least within pretty soon, as I mentioned earlier, should be a complete that part. So next part is to continuation of this kind of reforms so that from 2025 onwards, even 2024, it's going to be the first year after the crisis we are going to report positive economic growth for the whole year. We have seen already three quarters of last three quarters, we, we saw positive economic growth. 5.4 in the Q1 of the this year. So we need to continue that positive growth momentum. So that is the path of recovery. So medium to long term, we need to ensure country will be growing at least around 4 to 5% so that we will have much better living conditions. We'll have much better ability for the government to provide services for the people. So that's where, that's how people's income can 
in can be increased so that they can meet the high prices that already prevailing the income should be going now so for that process short term stability is already i think almost achieved next process is what i am talking i like to talk about next 10 years until 2032 at least under the program until 2032 government will not have a significant debt burden there's sufficient time for the government of the country to implement sufficient reforms so that our capacity to grow potential growth can be enhanced much that so people can benefit so that's where next process should be focusing on country to increase the capacity work some lot lot of other things like female labor force participation only 35% of female are in the workforce why can't they be 70% they can contribute more to the economy they can be their incomes can be higher so those are the medium to long term that we should now when back on while preserving the short term gains and keeping those gains on the sustainable basis and also enhance our ability to grow enhance the ability for the people to increase their incomes that's a medium plan to target that's why in that direction that's why it's important now i always say this is a very narrow path we need to move in that path and without falling into the fit poles going forward because it's a narrow path we should ensure that we are moving in the right direction as we have done in last two years we need to continue and at a much more committed way in the same same direction beyond 2020 uh, 2032 you mentioned what would be the debt because to this uh, debt to gdp by the time we should be able to settle a lot of debt at lower rate mm-hmm. and then our economy should be at a much higher stage our ability to uh, mm-hmm. borrow more or ability to debt service debt would be much higher uh, even be- before 20 i mean i don't think one should be It's difficult to project on predict for longer term, but still current program that will ensure the sustainability at least until 2032. So when you reach that target, you can have a new program how to go beyond that. That's I don't think we should be, uh, I mean, I'm not a person who is planning a very long term. First you address current issue and then go forward gradually one by one and then stabilize it. you're quite optimistic but you also warned against policy changes yeah. we'd like to talk about all that when we return after this short break here at hyde park we are in conversation with the governor of the central bank of sri lanka dr nandalal virasinghe do stay with us we'll be right back Welcome back. We are discussing Sri Lanka's economy and if the policy decisions will take Sri Lanka out of bankruptcy and the crisis situation. Uh, Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe, in May mentioned, uh, warned actually against economic policy changes, cautioning that um, any potential changes to the current economic policy and deviation whatsoever from the existing policy framework could lead to a return to economic policy. uh stagnation why did you say that were there any policy changes that you foresaw uh being taken you know, this uh, the the statement that i made on the con- in the context of uh the key economic parameters for example now the government of country's commitment with the imf for us to restore the sustainability for the economy to grow are there are key parameters one is from the key one is basically the uh government fiscal imbalance this is the root cause of the economic crisis that we all understand that without addressing root cause we can't go anywhere else this is where this is important going forward the country has committed to maintain what they call fiscal balance so primary surplus of the government without interest payment government revenue and expenditure government should be able to generate the surplus in the revenue minus interest expense interest expense no one can control it is the monetary policy so government income and expenditure if the ga- government can generate a medium to long term over 2% of surplus in that account that is necessary so if any government in the future are planning to reverse that direction obviously that will lead to another debt crisis that's why it's important first part on the government side fiscal and debt sustainability is important that's how we came into this crisis that is paramount important for any future government to maintain fiscal discipline 
without promising things that you can't deliver, without having, having expenditure more than the revenue, other than interest expenditure, then that will create a crisis. That's the first important one. Relating to that is the other one for the country. It's, that's for the government. For the country, country's ability to earn foreign exchange as a country than what we spend as a country. That's what we call current account, deficit or surplus of the Sri Lanka. So with the policies that we had, we were able to record for 2023 current account surplus, which means country was able to earn foreign exchange more than we spend in terms of current expenditure of foreign exchange. So exports, remittances, tourism, uh, all these things taken together were higher than what we imported, what we paid out as expenditure. This was the first time for long years, full year current account surplus was recorded. Going forward, even this year, we are going to re record same current account surplus. The, what, how economy has transformed into that is that even with short term measures, we are able to, as a country, not with the government, country is a much broader uh, perspective, country has been able to, more for, uh, able to earn more for exchange than we spend. That's how you, the additional is built up as resource. When you b earn more, that will stabilize the exchange rate, that will build more resource to, for us to use uh, on a rainy day, Th that will create buffers for the government or for the country as a central bank to meet any external, external shock. The higher revenues for the government will create buffers for the government, so to meet any external or internal shock, for, fear, for example, a flood or something. Government should have a, some buffer for them to spend in that kind of situation. That's why it's all about creating buffers for the government, creating buffers for the country in terms of foreign exchange earnings and foreign exchange savings of the country. That's why reserves and the current account surplus, ability to earn more than what has happened in the last several decades. We have been spending, as a country, spending more in terms of foreign exchange than we are earning. So we fill the gap with borrowings. Borrowings are good as long as those borrowings will generate future income, future foreign exchange income. So that did not happen. As a result, we continue to borrow, fill the gap, and we came into an unsustainable debt. So to address that, we need to transform the economy from the kind of a country that we borrowed and lived, and country that earn and live. Earn, generate surpluses, and then live. That is the more sustainable. That's why this transformation of one government is sustainable, fiscal sustainable, as a country's foreign exchange earning capacity. In terms of that's why we always call, historically we have been called import dependent country. But we had to be export foreign exchange earning country, export oriented economy. That transformation will have to happen not by not only by the government, but the private sector. Any businesses, any SME, any businesses, private sector should be should be focusing towards earning for an exchange for the country so that they can spend, I mean, why we can't import motor vehicles now? Because we are not earning sufficient for an exchange for us to spend. If we earn more in terms of foreign exchange, either way, the services, remittances, exports, anything, then we can allow people to import as much as what they want. So we can do that is because we are not transforming the economy as a for an exchange earning country. So we have to be a surplus country, we have to create buffers. You, ca you can't have all the time, but there could be certain years deficits, but that has to be recorded in the following year. That for that to happen, the whole economy should be transformed into a what they call export oriented economy. That's the only way out in the medium to long term. That reform will have to happen, therefore that reform to happen, we need to have several structural bottlenecks and uh, problems will have to be addressed for us to promote people, our industries, our services should be able to service globally. Where do you think those changes and reforms should come from? These are the, the some of the reforms that if you look at the reforms in, into the uh, Board of Investment, okay. reforms into doing business, reforms uh, for facilitate people to earn more competitive businesses, uh, do competitive businesses globally, not locally reduce the protection locally and make them more competitive globally so that our people who SMEs and anyone who produce anything, who, pr uh, who produce goods or services, they should be able to sell that goods or services not only in Sri Lanka, 
anywhere in the world they have to be should be competitive enough that they should be able, therefore that we need to bring down the cost of uh, production cost of electricity that maintain low inflation we have to reduce the cost of doing business uh, all this these are the what i call medium to long term reforms once we stabilize the economy next important step for any government is to work towards those are not short term things those are will need to be committed reforms that will focusing on improving competitiveness of the economy so that our businesses our goods and services should be able to compete globally we we new new products new markets all these things will have to happen and this is i don't think i can there's a long list of things i, I have no time to do, but we discuss a lot about this i right, certainly uh, you mentioned about uh, saving for a rainy day and uh, and and how the current measures taken mm -hmm. are looking at building the, the rebuilding buffers. the buffers uh, but governor do you think this concept is understood by uh, authorities or i'm not going to talk politics mm. but uh, have we understood this because we've really plunged yeah. into a deep crisis oh, this is a very important point uh, um, uh, because you know it's all about general public understanding of these issues so if you if they don't understand these are the important issues then they could be misled by false promises okay when we come there as a short term short cuts and short term measures so you will get some short term benefits i don't think this is where it's important the media institutions like yours uh, can contribute towards this to public awareness and public knowledge of the real situation of the country and where we need to do real changes so then people understand people will support that as long as if people don't understand these are the critical necessary reforms for medium to long term they could be misled by different kind of things so we we'll, when we come that we will increase salaries by this amount we'll give this thing that thing and because everything every time when you uh, my my uh, the kind of belief is that every time when there is a new policy new promise always from the government side one should does from me you are going to finance this tell us okay you will give this thing that thing but tell us if, if you going to reduce taxes how you feel that gap someone else should be paying that gap otherwise you have to cut expenditure somewhere so there is a balance between expenditure and revenue for the government that is a important part when it comes to this kind of promises but it is much broader than the government it's the people's understanding of they they need to be competitive in their production processes they should be able to compete globally they need to improve productivity of their businesses so they need to be much more efficient so that they can be competitive globally that is not something government can do that is something people's understanding people who are doing businesses they, i mean this whole idea of entrepreneurship is that how how competitive they can be first part is if you look at locally you try to be competitive locally but if you are to be competitive globally you have it's a different game you must be able to bring in technology bring in investment and have practices that you can compete anywhere else in the world that's what we see successful countries i mean that they have been able to compete and they are they are, they are basically prosper is that why we don't have such a large private sector that can support the economy of yeah. course we have we have uh, big players but isolated yeah i think th this is one of the structural issues if you look at the Uh, big firms so even SMEs, lot of businesses and production processes are trying to provide goods and services only for the local market. But they are not. I mean, this is tourism is one thing. I mean, this is a global service that that is a you know low hanging fruit. That's one easy area. But beyond that, any production of goods or services that if they can. if they can compete on locally i think that's a very limited market if they can compete globally so it strikes the limit so that's where if you look at some of the successful sectors for example garment sector is not something that uh, is run by the garment it's they they themselves are improved now our one is this one uh, one example is the tea also another fact rubber is another fact with these some of the sectors have been able to compete globally they are global players they can sell their products to any other market at a competitive rates that's how business should be and why we don't see that much of 
I mean, if you look at our large SMEs, small businesses, are mainly catering to only for local people, local local market. But that's that's a limit to where you can expand. That's where I think uh, uh, we need to support, you know, have a creative, uh, enabling environment for that kind of business to prosper and support them. You said uh, above three percent growth is possible for Sri Lanka if we implement these reforms. And uh, you mentioned about manufacturing, export, and services. What's really the edge for Sri Lanka if we are? This is through your expertise of decades of service. Yeah, I think on the on the growth rate, I think this is a conservative. Is if you do right things, we can grow well above four to five percent. Three percent is something even without doing much. I think we have capacity to grow. For example, India is growing last three years over seven percent. So India is a country like you know is much lower in terms of market, but still there's a potential. So this country like us has a clearly a potential to grow about four to five percent. It's to facilitate this growth process. Then what are the opportunities? What are the services that we can compete globally? For example, if you look at our potential, is we have a, the geographical location Sri Lanka is located in some major zero. So logistic services, port related services, ports and airport services. And then tourism is a huge potential here. These are the sectors that can, for instance, even the production of goods and services. I don't think Sri Lanka is country like we can compete with Bangladesh or Vietnam, that cheap labor country. We are not a country that can provide mass amount of cheap labor. We have to be much more kind of a technologically advanced products or services. There is a misperception that. People talk about what they call uh, what they call nishpadan artike manufacturing economy. It's a myth uh, to me. It's a if you produce, you you don't need to produce any physical good for the country to prosper. You need to produce either good or services depending on your capacity to grow. So here, in my view, Sri Lanka has the potential to compete more in the services sector than producing something. Like a garment or something, it's a, it's a product. It has to be high-end technology, uh, innovative, high-end products. That we have the advantage. Other than that, we have tourism, data services, given the location, given the close to the big markets, and access to all these free trade agreements will give more market access to all these countries. So with that, we have huge potential. So how to harness? So if you look at the sea resources, ocean resources, we are blessed with all the resources. Okay. But we are not uh, basically uh, utilizing all these things, given the advantage of the location and all the resources. So these are the areas that uh, we have potential, obviously. That we and also uh, domestic, uh, the mineral uh, and all these resources that we have. But we need to explore. No point of having all these resources under the under the you know, earth. You, sh you should be able to get that out and add value and export and earn for exchange. Uh, Governor, I just have a couple of minutes, but uh, so much to discuss. I'd like to ask a few questions in one go. Seventh uh, of April, 2022, you took over as Governor of the Central Bank, 17th Governor, at the height of the crisis when we plunged uh, into depths of. Um, uh, you, you don't like to call it bankruptcy. You say we announced a, a debt, debt standstill. Stand yes. um, again, now the government is coming up with an economic transformation mm. bill, announcing as a law uh, the target set out by the IMF. Elections are around the corner. Uh, how does this economic stability and continuing our image internationally, working with creditors and ensuring that uh, the economy prospers as optimistic as you are amid mm. these elections? What's your message finally? No, I think the, uh, the economic transition bill and other reforms that is, is not central bank. I think it's the government. I have to recognize and appreciate the role played by the government in terms of fiscal policy and economic reforms. All these things were done by the government. So in that process, I think the whole idea of economic transition bill is to uh, basically inbuild some of the targets uh, that we have committed ourselves with the IMF in the medium to long term. It built into a kind of legislation, so that going forward, any administration coming in the future, so we'll have a kind of a commitment to go in the same same direction. If they obviously, any elected government, as a sovereign uh, elected by people, have the right to change all any law. They think if that is not suitable, obviously they have the right to change uh, through the legislation. That, but still. 
given the framework that has worked well so far and looking at what are the reforms that those are needed going forward as I mentioned uh, the uh, Productivity Commission, um, International Trade Office, there are a lot of other things, Productivity Commission, all these things are in that bill in addition to some of the targets government has already committed. So it is just to ensure continuity of the policy in the same direction. Obviously any government in the future they want to change even current government if they are elected. Any government should have the right to revise reform uh, in the right direction but my clear message is that overall macro framework as I said revenue fiscal and external sector monetary policy that framework should be protected should be preserved without deviating from this key ma overall macro principles while engaging and promoting other growth oriented reforms so that we our ability to grow of the country can be enough not from not only three percent but four to five percent so that people's living standard could be much higher the faster that we implement those reforms. That's why it's important to move in the same direction going forward. Thank you very much, Governor, for taking the time to clarify matters uh, that have arisen in society, in Parliament, and to talk about uh, the economic reforms and the central bank uh, obligations to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. We were in discussion with the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe, who has also served as an alternative, uh, alternate Executive Director of the IMF for India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Bhutan back in 2010 and 2012, served uh, as the Director of the Board of Management of the Sustainability Energy Authority and the Board of Investment and in charge of negotiating financial services in bilateral trade and services agreements with China and Singapore and a career central banker who took office on the 7th of April 2022 as the 17th governor of Sri Lanka. We'll see you again next week at the same time with yet another discussion. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.